Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Creator, help us this evening to recognize the importance of your presence in our lives. Fill us with your Holy Spirit as we pray. O God, Trinity of love, from the profound communion of your divine life, pour out upon us a torrent of love. Grant that we may live the gospel seeking Christ in every one we meet. We are different faces, but all of the same humanity. We are loved by you, our one true God. And we make this prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Again, might I welcome everybody. This is a really <clears throat> wonderful to see so many faces at this webinar. Tonight's webinar, like I said, is the second of our of our webinars in this series, and it is on persistent inequality and racism, racism in its different forms of the past 75 years. Our first speaker tonight is Richard Zipfel, and I know most people here would know him, but I'm going to introduce Richard for those who do not. Richard is an American citizen who has lived in Britain for more than 50 years now. He worked for 30 years as um, a policy advisor on race and community relations for the Bishops' Conference of England and Wales. Since his retirement, he has served as a trustee of CAJ, and most recently, not that recently, uh, Richard has served as, as secretary to the trustees, and we're all very, very grateful to Richard on CAJ. Tonight, he will be reflecting on the period 1947, that's the year of my birth, to 1985. He will discuss legislation on immigration and nationality, relations between the police and the black community, discrimination in housing, employment, and education. He'll do something on the Scarman Report, that, which came out in 1981, in which Lord Scarman rejected the allegation that Britain was an institutionally racist society. So quite a lot in there. And Richard only has 20 minutes, but he'll do his best. Richard Zippel. Thank you. Thank you, Yogi. And good evening, everybody. And uh, Gloria, can you? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> we're exploring, I'm going to try to explore persistent inequality and racism over the past 75 years. Obviously, this... Um, could be a library of books on, on the topic, but I'm going to try to just highlight a few of the topics that can give us a bit of a memorandum or a memory of these, uh, of those 40 years. Um, so we're looking at 1947 and 1985. Next slide, please. And to explore this, I'm going to look at four areas, immigration and nationality, mainly the legislation that was passed to restrict people from coming here, but not entirely. The police and the black community, housing, employment and ed education, and the Scarman Report. Next slide, please. Okay, <clears throat> so we're, <coughs> excuse me, we're back after the Second World War, when partly because of a shortage of labor in the UK, people were welcome to come and even recruited from other parts of the world. Hard to imagine the government having a program of recruit, recruiting people from other parts of the world. The 1948 Nationality Act was not restricting people coming here, but it gave all imperial subjects 
the right of free entry into post-war Britain. So the atmosphere was welcoming people. A foreign labor committee was set up and it had a million jobs to offer to people coming in agriculture, hospitals, mining, and other essential industries. And in the decade that followed the voyage of the Windrush, that's 1947 to 1957 roughly, nearly a quarter of a million Black and Asian migrants, first from the Caribbean, then from partitioned India, Africa, and Hong Kong, came to Britain. That, that 10 years of an influx of people from other parts of the world actually shifted attitudes and many white people in Britain reacted negatively. And this led to a period of negative legislation. Next slide, please. <clears throat> The legislation that followed restricted the rights of immigrants and was often specifically aimed at black immigrants, but not specific, not necessarily explicitly, but the rationale behind the changes that came about were often to exclude black people from different parts of the world. The 1962 Commonwealth Immigrants Act for the first time imposed controls on the entry of citizens of independent Commonwealth countries. Commonwealth workers had to enter the country under an employment voucher scheme, which prioritized skilled workers and those with a specific job to come to, restricting others. The 1968 Commonwealth Immigrants Act imposed new restrictions on some holders of UK and colonies passports, and some priority was given to those whose parents or grandparents were born, naturalized, or adopted in the UK or in a Commonwealth country already self-governing in 1948. The 1971 Immigration Act made a new distinction between patrials and non-patrials. And that distinction went forward into the Nationality Act. A patrial is a citizen of the UK and colonies or any other Commonwealth country who was born, adopted, registered, or naturalized in Britain or whose mother or father was born here. In 1973, the changes in the immigration rules extended the patriality to those with a grandparent born in Britain. The Nationality Bill 1981 became law in 1983, <clears throat> and it incorporated much of what was in these other four pieces of legislation or three pieces of legislation and rules. Next slide, please. There was much criticism of these changes that came, come, came about in the 60s and 70s in our legislation. But one of the things that gave some legitimacy to that criticism or more legitimacy to that criticism was that in their report of 14th December, 1973, the European Commission on Human Rights found an effectively racial bias running through the 1964 Nationality Act, the 1968 Commonwealth Immigrants Act, the 1971 Immigration Act, and the Immigration Rules 1973. The arrangements built into these laws were incorporated into the Nationality Act 1981, so it can be inferred that um, that also contained 
and effectively racial bias. Nine, um, next slide, please. Sorry, Gloria, could you go back to the previous one? I just wanted to say that the criticism I spoke of of this legislation was especially strong in the early 1980s. The government, the labor government, had produced a green paper on changes that are necessary in nationality. And then that became legislation in the early 1980s. But the bishops of England and Wales did a lengthy briefing on the nationality bill and suggested a number, a large number of changes that should be made in order to make that, that bill morally acceptable. So if anyone's interested in that period ending and culminating in the Nationality Act, you may also be interested in the bishop's um, statements which um, you may already know about, but but if if you are interested, we can we can put you in touch with them. Thank you. Next slide, please. <clears throat> the police and the black community. Meeting between 1960 and 62, the Royal Commission on the Police didn't even mention relations with the black community when commenting on the main areas of friction in police community relations. So like so many other things, the attitudes, the, the kind of atmosphere in the country can shift from in, in a few years or a decade. 10 years later in 1972, there was a select committee of the House of Commons on Race Relations and Immigration, and it submitted its report on police immigrant relations. Among its 30 recommendations for improving police community relations, many had specific reference to the black community. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Tensions between the police and the black community were often around questionable powers which were given to the police and disproportionately used against black people or which were kind of adopted by the police uh, and used in a way that they weren't originally necessarily intended. One that was a matter of considerable controversy over many years was what was called the Sus Law. Section four of the 1824 Vagrancy Act had the offense of being a suspected person loitering with intent to commit a felonious offense. Anyone can see the possibility of that being misused. And it was. In 1977, 44% of those arrested for sus in the metropolitan area were black. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Stop and search. Under the Misuse of Drugs Act 1971, <clears throat> if a constable has reasonable grounds to suspect that any person is in possession of a controlled drug, the constable may search that person and detain him for the purpose of searching him. Often, these stop and search incidents did not lead to an arrest, but they were familiar to many black people who found them humiliating and provocative. And of course, stop and search remains an issue today. The use of excessive force and racial abuse in police activity was a concern at the time. And finally, inadequacy of the police complaints procedure, which at that time remained in the hands of the police. So these are some of the 
areas of concern and criticism about the, the relationship between the police and the black community in the 1960s and 1970s. Next slide, please. Housing, employment, and education. I just want to touch on these areas and suggest some of the discrimination and disadvantage that was going on at the time. Too often, Black people found themselves the object of discrimination in housing, employment, and education. In the early decades after Windrush, there were signs outside rental properties and properties were being offered for rent, rooms for rent, uh, be precisely because immigrants were coming into the country. The signs often read, rooms for rent, no blacks, no Irish, no dogs. And this was so common that it became commonplace for people to talk about it. Too often, skilled black people found themselves having to take unskilled jobs when they came here. One gentleman from Dominica, who was an experienced teacher, came here in 1956 and had to take a job shoveling coal on the trains. Later, he became a postman Later still, he worked in an administrative job for British Telecom. And in his 50s, he took early retirement and became a racism awareness trainer. So he finally, if you want, came back to his vocation of teaching, but only after many years of working in jobs that were as, I don't like the language, below his skill level. Next slide, please. Finally, just looking briefly at education, too often capable black students were discouraged from applying for university by teachers of goodwill who wanted to prevent them from experiencing failure. And sometimes a teacher would be discouraging black pupils from going to university and then someone would bring to his or her attention the, if you want, the unconscious stereotype. And he or she, the teacher, would change their way of working, change their attitude and their behavior toward black students. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Finally, the Scarman Report, and now we're in 1981. And following the disturbances involving the police and the black community in Brixton on the weekend of 10th to 12th, April, 1981, Lord Scarman was asked to conduct an inquiry into these events. His report, which went to more than 200 pages, was published in November, 1981. So he did it in a year. The report said of black youngsters, so this is, was his view that he was building on, their lives are led largely in the poorer and more deprived areas of our great cities. Unemployment and poor housing bear on them very heavily, and the educational system has not adjusted itself satisfactorily to their needs. Their difficulties are intensified by the sense they have of a concealed discrimination against them, particularly in relation to job opportunities and housing. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Lord Scarman in his report goes on to say, it was alleged to me by some of those who made representation to me that Britain is an institutionally racist society. If by that is meant that it is a society which knowingly 
as a matter of policy, discriminates against Black people, I reject the allegation. If, however, the suggestion being made is that practices may be adopted by public bodies as well as by private individuals, which are unwittingly discriminatory against Black people, then this is an allegation which deserves serious consideration and where proved, swift remedy. Next slide, please. And later in the report, he says, institutional racism does not exist in Britain, but racial disadvantage and its nasty associate racial discrimination have not yet been eliminated. They poison minds and attitudes. They are, and as long as they remain, will continue to be a potent factor of unrest. And he's referring here to his original, <coughs> uh, the original purpose of his inquiry, the unrest that had happened in Brixton. Next slide, please. So the Scarman Report 1981 painted a picture of serious discrimination and disadvantage across a number of areas, housing, employment, and education, but it denied institutional racism. And this remained an unresolved issue for almost 20 years. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Um, just to say to everybody now, this we're going to have 10 minutes, and this is your opportunity to make comment, to ask questions. And if you put up your hand in the corner of your box, um, Gloria will see that and prompt Richard. If you uh, uh, do not wish to, to say it out loud, but you want to, want to ask a question, you may use the chat, use the chat box and, and, and uh, write it in there. And Gloria will pass that on to Richard. So open to everybody now. Thanks again, Richard. Joe. I'm, hope I'm hoping Gloria can see everybody because I can't. <laughs> uh, I, well, Joe was raising his hand. Yes. Fine. Yes. Okay. Um, thank, thank you, Richard. One question. You stated in, that in 1973, the European, the then the European Community Commission, um, uh, raised some serious concerns about um, the situation in the UK. That was um, um, in the lead up to Britain joining the European Commission. Why was the entry of Britain then allowed? Mm -hmm. Good question. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it, it just, uh, the, oh, it's just... Oh, yes, it's, 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 it's a very up. good question. But <clears throat> when was... When did... When did I think, I think uh, Britain joined before that. No, Britain joined in 1974. Oh. Okay. Maggie has her hand up. I think Maggie wants to make a comment on that. Mm. Yeah, just, just on... I had a separate question, but just on that... The European Commission and the European Court of Human Rights belong to a separate body, which is the Council of Europe. Uh, so it, we joined the European Union subsequently, but the, in a sense, the Commission on Human Rights has got nothing to do with the EU. Mm. So that's why it applied to us, because we'd signed up to the you know, Council of Europe and the European Convention on Human Rights sort of thing. So, so that it was two separate institutions that, funny enough, just today I was discussing how they can get so easily confused. Uh, there are 47 members of the Council of Europe at the moment, so that just gives you an impression totally different from the EU. Uh, my question, Richard, thanks very much indeed, was um, on Scarman. I had just sort of thought it was also a lot about policing, but you, you yes. mentioned it was mainly housing, employment. No, so did no. you focus more on what the reasons for the disturbances were rather than how the disturbances were handled? The, the I was trying to lead into um, the point of discussion of institutional racism, which kind of became a big thing out of the Scarman report. I wasn't trying to summarize the Scarman report entirely because um, it was a very long report and it contained 
I, I don't remember how much about policing, but um, do you want to make comment on the policing, Maggie? No, no, I was just, I, I just, uh, I'll go and look at it now, but I was just interested in the policing aspect and I, I thought maybe it had been, it had been deliberately excluded, but I'll go and check it myself. No, now. I, Thanks. I, Thanks, I just, I just pulled it, I pulled out the things that were relative, I thought were relevant yeah. to institutional racism yeah. and that was the various areas of discrimination, which you might then say, well, if all, all this is going on, okay. Is there another hand? Or anything in the chat box, Gloria? Rabina would like to say something. R Rabina? Yeah. You need to You're um, muted mute to Rabina. I was working in housing advice in the 1970s um, and I remember quite a lot of racism on behalf of local authorities in terms of housing people. Um, arguments made about they would be happier with people of their own kind. Mm -hmm. So we'll move them into this area Mm. which was a less desire it ha happened of course coincidentally to be a less desirable area mm. but they said it's not fair to move people so that they're just you know on their own in a in a white area mm. um and again it was i mean a lot of it was was pure ignorance i mean it shouldn't have been but i mean it was people didn't If you talk to the housing officers, a lot of them were not being deliberately discriminatory. And, and when you explain to them, they would off, would occasionally change, you know, change, change their minds, as it were. Um, but I think that in local government, there was a lot of at least unconscious bias that should not have been there. Mm. That was still going on up to the Oldham riots as well with the Muslim communities. Mm. Mm. Same housing policies uh, that's changed since, but it was still there in the uh, year 2000. Mm. That's wonderful. Anybody else? No. Everybody happy then for us to move on? Okay. Sue. Sue had her hand up. Sue. Right. Yeah. Um, of course it's still going on now in terms of asylum seekers, but that's another story. Uh the business of unconscious prejudice, di uh, discrimination, etc. If you don't mix with people, you don't understand what they, what their feeling is in relation to the actions that you're taking. So it's if you were ghettoizing people, of course, it was going to just carry on as being discriminatory, whether they were claiming that it wasn't institutionalized, it was because people just didn't see the bigger picture they didn't understand how other people would feel they didn't see them as human beings in the same way that they were because they simply weren't rubbing up against them enough until it became much more widespread that you know through schools etc people became more conscious of this mm -hmm. richard do you want to come back no i i think that's right but I think some of the teachers I was referring to, well, they probably had um, 
it would be interesting to look at them individually and see the differences. But um, and it certainly wasn't all teachers, but there was this this trend, if you want, of of teachers who were right really interested in doing in in helping black youngsters to achieve but had this kind of notion notion that they seemed to be not not aware of until somebody pointed it out to them and they started reflecting on it um that some black youngsters would want to go to university and then would fail um and it was that assumption that they might fail and the worry about it um, that seemed to be uh, one of the, one of the many issues in, in education that um, got discussed over time. Father Phil. Yeah, just to say that Mallory Blackman in her uh, most recent autobiography refers to herself being advised by her careers officer in, in uh, sixth form not to go to a university in London, but to go to a metropolitan university elsewhere because she was a black woman yeah. and couldn't achieve. Yeah. Mm. Um, um, I hate to do this to Celia Capstick now, but Celia, Celia was head of sixth form and um, you know, I'm sure she sent a lot of black children to university. Celia, would you like to say something about that? Because it would have been during those same days. Uh, you muted, Celia. I was just thinking and pondering that in the 80s, we were encouraging them to apply, but they were distinctly, um, I think, felt that they wouldn't be successful. So it, it was a two-way thing, really. Very difficult to uh, analyse. And when one or two did go, they weren't always happy. So, you know, there was still... Um, a not comfortable way of, I mean, this changed when the numbers changed. As the numbers grew, uh, then it, it became, an, you know, uh, 10 or 20 years later, it's, it's just not a problem. So it was something to do with the, um, literally with the fact that there weren't that many trying. And, and you did have to get over the fact that parents didn't always uh, see that as a route either. They hadn't been to university. The university wasn't seen as the natural route for everybody. And A-levels were quite difficult, I think, for them to achieve. So all sorts of factors meant that we weren't getting a great numbers, certainly, into universities. But it was beginning. And uh, and looking back, I think, you know, it, it progressed from then, but it took a long time. Each of these areas, employment, education, and housing, I just really touched on them, and each one would be an area to be explored in depth with many com complexities, like you're describing in education. Thank you, Richard, and, and thank you, everybody, for that. And we're going to move on. Our second speaker tonight is Margaret Ann Fiskin, and again, I think most of you would know Margaret Ann. She is a barrister by profession, but Margaret Ann has held many, many posts within the church and outside of the church. And uh, I, I, for me, one of the very best was that she was the chair of the Catholic Association for Racial Justice for a number of years. Uh, Margaret is now um, an emerita to the Kaj and still one of our outside workers. So Margaret Ann still feeds in quite a lot. And we're really grateful for Margaret Ann coming this evening. And she now is going to build on Richard's fantastic synopsis of the years 1947 to 1981. Margaret Ann will discuss the separate but intertwined themes of asylum and immigration. Pretty toughy, uh, but then she's a tough girl and she, she's going to be able to do that. And she's going to take it from 1980 to the present date. Margaret Ann, thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Yogi. Okay. Um, hello, everybody. Um, this topic is so broad, and like I'm acutely conscious that there is such a, bra a vast breadth of information around it. And I think 
Richard described it as a library. Um, and it, there really is so much here. Um, that, so in dealing with issues around race, policy, migration, inequality, so I, I'm a little bit embarrassed because Richard's presentation was so structured and logical. Mine is going to be um, chronological, but far less structured and logical than Richard's. And um, I'm just going to try and highlight some of the significant events that took place um, that are relevant to our theme. So um, I'm going to begin by saying, um, Richard spoke about the, um, the 40 years prior to the time that I am speaking about. And he mentioned the Immigration Act of 1962. Um, now, Richard said with the 1948 Act, there appeared to be a sort of welcoming approach, um, asking people to come, but then by 1962, it was, um, I think the word that Richard used, there was perhaps a, um, some negative legislation that began to, to creep in. Um, I think uh, that up to the point that Richard was speaking about, um, both major political parties had signed up to the idea that immigration needed to be restricted. And I think the reasons that were given, whether directly or indirectly, were to promote integration or perhaps assimilation in those days as they saw it, of those groups who had already arrived. So I would suggest that up to that point, although there were controversies and disagreements and discussions concerning immigration, it wasn't a significant party political issue. And I'm also going to suggest that this party political consensus started to break down as the numbers of asylum seekers started to rise from the late 80s, early 90s onwards. And so from the late 80s, we have, as Yogi said, two strands running concurrently in government policymaking. We have legislation that impacts the settled communities who are already there, and we have legislation to address the new migrants who are now coming into Britain. And although they are separate strands, they do intersect at points, and um, I, I will deal with that as well. Um, okay, so having said all of that, <laughs> I'm going to begin with an unapologetically uh, provocative quote. Next slide, please, Gloria. So this is a book by a guy called Colin Yeo. He's a campaigner and an immigration barrister. And he describes the UK immigration system as unforgiving, unfeeling, and ultimately failing. And I would like to ask you just to think about this um, as I speak and bearing in mind everything that Richard has said. So how would we treat Paddington Bear if he came to the UK today? Perhaps he would be made destitute as a result of extortion at visa application fees. Perhaps he would experience a cruel term of imprisonment in a detention center. Or perhaps his entire identity would be torn apart at the hands of a hostile environment that seems to delight in the humiliation of its victims. Britain thinks of itself as a welcoming country, but the reality is and always has been very different. As I said, it's provocative, but I'd like you to think about it. Um, next slide, please, Gloria. So, as I said, not as structured or logical as Richard's, I'm going to say like, in the late 80s, we had the, um, the destruction of the Berlin Wall. We had Europe opening. In 1992, we had um, the UK joined uh, the EU nations in signing the Maastricht Treaty on European Integration. This granted all EU citizens equal rights with freedom to live in any member state they chose. So in the decade, the 90s, 
thousands of EU citizens came to live and work in Britain. But equally, um, lots of British people were going to live and work in the, in the EU. So it all sort of balanced out. It wasn't a dramatic shift. Um, next slide, please, Gloria. Now, as you can see, I'm, I, like I say, I'm swaying back and forth, but I'm doing it chronologically. So in 1993, um, you had the murder of Stephen Lawrence. And this was 12 years after the Scarman Report in 1981. So where Lord Scarman denied the existence of institutional racism. So the murder of um, black teenager Stephen Lawrence in 1993 and the subsequent investigation or lack of one reignited the discussion around race and policing. In the initial investigation, five suspects were arrested and released without charge. It was soon evident that the handling of the case by the police and the CPS was affected by race. Next slide, please, Gloria. And then the government commissioned a report on the murder of Stephen Lawrence after much pressure. And the conclusion of this was in 1999, the McPherson Report, um, which in fact was called the Stephen Lawrence Inquiry Report. And Lord McPherson specifically asked that it be remembered as the Stephen Lawrence Inquiry Report so that he would never be forgotten. Well, he hasn't been forgotten, but the, the fact of the report being the Stephen Lawrence Inquiry Report has. So it was a 350 page report and it concluded the investigation had been marred by, quote, a combination of professional incompetence, institutional racism, and a failure of leadership. So finally, in 1999, institutional racism was acknowledged as a thing, a, a real um, feature of British life. I'm going to come back to the concept of institutional racism, and I'll say very briefly that if Father Phil was here, was doing this with me, I would give a thorough definition of um, McPherson's um, definition on uh, institutional racism, and he would then pipe up and um, explain that what I was saying meant nothing, and he would <laughs> he would explain it in very understandable terms. But I don't have time for that tonight. So a total of 70 recommendations designed to show zero tolerance for racism in society were made. Many of these up to now have not been implemented. Uh, next slide, please, Gloria. Again, we're going back and I will join things up eventually. Um, so 1999, you have, um, Institutional racism recognized as a concept. 2004, you have the second EU expansion and you have Cyprus and Malta join the EU along with eight Central and Eastern European countries. And you, you have, um, this is finally the, the ending of the division of Europe after the Second World War. But on this occasion, many, many more migrants came to, well, yes. And again, the word migrant is one that um, has different meanings, but people who came to stay for more than 12 months um, came to the UK and it began to, the, again, as Richard said, um, back in the 60s, people reacted and um, blamed people if they were job shortages and things. This started to happen now in 2004 with the second EU expansion. The first in 1992, not so much of this one. And the, pa the papers were um, actively kind of promoting this. So you had um, the settled communities, the uh, racial justice issues that were being dealt with there. And you had migration, you had refugee influxes and you had um, uh, European influxes and all these are coming together at the same time over the same period of time. Um, next slide please Gloria. 
And then in 2012, we had the hostile environment, which has never stopped. Um, so the hostile environment was a set of policies that were introduced by the then Home Secretary, Theresa May, with the aim of making life unbearably difficult in the UK for those who cannot show the right paperwork. And that was what it boiled down to, showing the right paperwork. It was intended as a measure to stop asylum seekers from coming in. Um, she's, or as she said at the time, the aim is to create, here in Britain, a really hostile environment for illegal immigrants. Charming. And this was, well, this was to prove um, a, a very dangerous policy. Uh, later on. So, um, Gloria, next slide, please. So, in 2018, we had the Windrush scandal. And it was because of the hostile environment policy that began in 2012, never intended for members of the settled community, intended to keep people out of the country who were trying to come in. But um, somehow, Theresa May um, managed to get away with this. Amber Rudd, who's in the picture, um, had to resign um, in, from her, po her post at the time. Um, next slide, please, Gloria. So the Windrush scandal began to surface in 2017 after it emerged that hundreds of Commonwealth citizens, many of whom were from the Windrush generation, had been wrongly detained, deported, and denied legal rights. Guardian journalist Amelia Gentleman investigated and began reporting their experiences. I'm coming back to Amelia Gentleman in a second. As these shocking stories hit the headlines, Caribbean leaders took up the issues with the then Prime Minister Theresa May. There was widespread shock and outrage at the fact that so many Black Britons had had their lives devastated by Britain's deeply flawed and discriminatory immigration system. So the reason I've highlighted um, Amelia Gentleman, I don't know if any of you know of her, but um, it is an interesting little tidbit, um, perhaps ironic, that she is now Baroness Johnson of Marlborne since her brother-in-law, Boris Johnson, made his brother, Amelia's husband, Baron Johnson of Marlebon. And it's just interesting that Boris's sister-in-law is the one who broke this and who is still quite passionate about it. And she's written a book um, giving a full account of the evolution of the Windrush scandal. And I can't remember the name of the book, but it, it's, it's worth reading. Um, so yeah, that was that was that. Next one, please. Sorry, I hope we can flesh out some of these um, later on um, in the in the chat. I'm just it's really a whistle stop tour. So as we know, the Brexit vote was, I believe, in 2016, and then um, 31st of January 2020 at 11 p.m. GMT, Brexit began. Now, so much has been said on Brexit and you get so much conflicting um, information, but I think something that has generally been agreed upon is that Brexit um, increased racial tensions. And the decision to leave was followed by an increase in race and religious hate crime of 15 to 25% in England and Wales. And th this is from the ONS. And I think you might elsewhere find that at work there you are she's back sorry folks i don't know what happened <laughs> i 
I just get back to it. Give me one second. Thank you very much, Claria. <laughs> Let's see where we are. Okay, so it's this one. And then we go to share. I think we were here, were we? Um, were we here? I think. Okay, well, let's go to the next one, please. Okay, that's fine. Let me just uh, make it a slide. Oop, sorry, I'm going to have to rush through. And so the next one, yeah? Yeah. And then um, in 2020, we had a collision of events. So we had um, the COVID-19 pandemic. And in the midst of this, we had the killing of George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter movement sprung to prominence. Um, as a result of this, um, the BLM movement and everything that was going on, the government commissioned a report on, um, well, next slide, please, Gloria. I can't remember the, the title of the report. Oh, okay, sorry. So there's one in between. I'll get to the next one. But all of this happened, and this report was already in the making um, when when yeah 2020 this had been um going on for two years between 2018 and 2020 so this is a joint report that came out ethnicity race and inequality in the uk state of the nation um and this report which was a joint report from the running me trust with 14 academics and the center on dynamics of ethnicity and the policy press of the university of bristol contains evidence, and I should have highlighted the word evidence, of inequalities across criminal justice, education, employment, housing, and health. And at the time that it came, when the report was published, the then director of the Running Me Trust, Omar Khan, said this, and I quote, if the Running, if Running Me is still around in 50 years, it will be because we haven't succeeded in developing the narrative policies and social pressure to combat the inequalities outlined in the book. We must admit that Britain has often believed in and supported racism as a matter of policy and practice. Recognizing that we haven't always lived up to our values will allow us to better frame and deliver on a positive vision for the future. So once again, I mean, this report said not only were there inequalities, but that some of them had been deliberately brought into practice and that they were, that they did demonstrate racial bias. Now the following year, next slide please, Gloria. 2021. Um, this was this is the report that was commissioned as a result of the BLM movement. And it was called the Commission on Race and Ethnic Disparities, the report, better known as the Sewell Report. Um, because um, Lord Sewell, now Lord Sewell, he was elevated to the House of Lords, um, was, um, was the chair of the commission that wrote this report. And he... Um, uh, yes, it said essentially that there was no um, problem with institutional racism in, um, in the UK. Okay, I'm going to just read a little bit here. The report caused outrage when it was, re with, when it was released. It was met with a chorus of criticism for several reasons, including saying that the UK does not have a systemic problem with racism. So we go back, you had the Scarman report, which said this. 12 years later, you had Stephen Lawrence's murder. In 1999, finally, you had institutional racism acknowledged. And now in 2021, um, the report is saying 
it doesn't exist. And it also said that um, that Britain was leading the way in Europe for um, questions around equality uh, in you know in their treatment of um, of black and minority ethnic groups. When this report was published, human rights experts from the U from the UN said that the report tried to, and I quote, normalize white supremacy. Stephen Lawrence's mother, Doreen Lawrence, said that it had put the fight for racial justice back 25 years. And you know, it raises an important question because how do we fight systemic or institutional racism when the government says it doesn't exist? I mean, where do you begin? Okay, um, and as I say, I hope we can flesh this out a bit because it, it's a really important thing that it it, it was it, it left a lot of people feeling like the work we've done over so many years counts for nothing if the government is going to endorse this report, um, which was supposed to be an independent report, but everybody appointed by the government. Uh, next slide, please, Gloria. And this was a, a statement, um, it's several teaching and student unions issued this statement in response to the report. The findings of the Commission on Racial and Ethnic Disparities shared by Dr. Tony Sewell are an insult to all those in Britain who experience racism every day of their lives. The report attempts to diminish the impact of, stru of structural and institutional racism on the lives of black people in the UK in the UK are all the more bawling in the midst of a pandemic where minority ethnic communities have borne a hugely disproportionate cost. It demonstrates an astonishing complacency and ignores the fact that any progress made in improving the lives of black people across the UK has been won by decades of determined campaigning against the odds. The report's suggestion the UK should be a model for other countries and their response to racism also ignores the wealth of evidence which points to deeply unequal experiences faced by black communities in the UK today. I mean, it's a powerful statement and there were many like it that were issued at the time. Next, please. So again, we are in 2022 now, and I mention this because when um, Russia invaded Ukraine, the UK stood up and said, yes, we will help, and paid people to take Ukrainians into their home, did everything within its power to accommodate the refugees that were coming. Um, next slide, please, Gloria. And in 2023, you have Sudanese refugees who are in an equally desperate state, but you don't hear about them. There aren't any special measures being taken to help these people. And I mean, one has to question why, you know? Um, and many Sudanese refugees want to come to the UK because of Sudan's historical colonial ties with the UK and because the, the language is English. And for many, this is the only European language that they speak and because of the presence of family and friends in the UK. And they believe that the UK as a former occupier of Sudan was governed them democratically. And they believe deeply that the UK is a place that respects human rights and where they will feel safe. But the only way they can claim asylum is in the UK is if they actually reach British soil. And that's where the catch 22 is. There are no safe and legal routes for them to get into the UK. So they risk life and limb to get onto the small boats to try and get across. And I, I, I put the two, I juxtapose the two because, you know, is there a racial element to this? It, it seems difficult to ignore um, that you know the the difference in approach of the UK government to the Ukraine and to Sudan, two crises that we're facing. 
Okay, um, next one, please. Okay, I and then this year, a few, I can't remember the date, but um, last month, I think, or two months ago, um, we had the Baroness Casey review, um, which was a review into the standards of behavior and internal culture of the Met Police Service. And two of the findings was that Black, Asian, and ethnic minority officers and staff are more likely to experience racism, discrimination, and bullying, and that there needs to be a more robust system of support for the mental health of these employees and other groups experiencing discrimination. This report is also important because Baroness Casey said very clearly that institutional racism exists within the Met. And the commissioner of police has refused to use the term institutional racism. He has said he's not going to use that term. So you just wonder how much, and he's, he's a brand new commissioner, you know, you just wonder how far can he go and why is he refusing to use the term when an independent review has said it exists? Again, I question. Okay, next one, please, Gloria. So again, in 2023, we have the Ill Illegal Migration Bill, which is in the news every day, so I don't want to dwell on it too much. But um, one of the five key pledges that Rishi Sunak set out in January was to stop asylum seekers arriving in the UK by small boats crossing at the English Channel. The number of people arriving this way has increased in recent years. Before 2020, um, it was in the low hundreds. In 2022, it was 45,000. Tragically, more than 130 people have died or gone missing trying to cross the channel since 2019. Of those who arrived safely, the vast majority, around 90%, have claimed asylum. Now, according to the Refugee Council's estimates, they say over two thirds of these claims are likely to be successful under the current system. So in order to act on the Prime Minister's commitment, the Home Secretary, Suella Braverman, has introduced the, Ill the Illegal Migration Bill into Parliament. It seeks to deter people from crossing the channel in small boats by preventing those that do so from claiming asylum in the UK, detaining and removing them to another country. And we all know that Rwanda is a country of choice at the moment. So, um, I mean, Obviously, something has to be done because people are losing their lives coming across on these small boats. But whether taking traumatized people and putting them on a plane to Rwanda and, again, maintaining the hostile environment is what Britain as a nation should be doing is open to question. And the I think the last one, Gloria, <laughs> I think I've gone over my time. I apologize. So I began with Paddington, and I'm going to close with Paddington. How would he be received now? So there was a two-year um, research project which came out, and it was, a, I, I can't remember the name of the organization that did it, but it was the largest and most comprehensive survey of race inequality in the UK over the past 25 years. And it has revealed disturbingly, but maybe not unsurprisingly, high levels of motivated physical and verbal abuse experienced by people from diverse ethnic and religious groups. The study also uncovered significant inequalities in education, employment, housing, and interactions with the police. I suppose you could say on the bright side, um, despite these issues, the vast majority of people report a strong sense of belonging to British society. And I really believe that this research is a wake up call to all of us who believe in a just and equitable society. You know, we can't ignore the evidence of discrimination and unfairness faced by the diverse groups in the UK. And we can't count on our leaders to do the right thing. And for those of us who care deeply about these issues, I think we have to figure out how we take action and address 
the inequalities that we find in various areas of British institutions. And I believe that it's crucial that we work together to create a racially just society where everyone can thrive regardless of their ethnic or religious background. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Margaret Anne. That was much, much more than a whistle stop. That was educational. <laughs> You're leaving us yet again with so much to think about. I'm praying and hoping that everybody here got a taster of the persistent inequality here in Britain over the past 75 years. Now, I'm sure that there are many, many questions going through your heads. Um, and I, I would like us now to take this opportunity whilst we're all together, we have about 20 minutes to share um, our, our thoughts, to share our um, suggestions, maybe to ask questions and, and, and let's have an open discussion on what we, we have heard. So we've got 20 minutes to do that. I also want to just say that Maggie put the, the title of the book um, in the chat, Margaret Ann, uh, yeah. if anybody's interested. So over oh to everybody God. now, you can, um, uh, if, when you speak, please unmute. And again, I'm going to ask Gloria to, to watch out for hands, please. Father Phil has his hand up first. So Father Phil. Was this the document you were referring to, Margaret Ann? Yes, yes. Oh, am I muted? No. Yes, that's exactly the one. Okay. Can you, can you, can you uh, read it out, yeah. Father Phil, please? It's Racism and Ethnic Inequality in a Time of Crisis. Findings from the Evidence of uh, for Equality National Survey. It's uh, called EVENS. I, I would always uh, refer to Father Phil because not only does he concur, he always has the book, Margaret Ann. Always. <laughs> Rubina has her hand up. Um, the other book is called The Windrush Betrayal, yeah. the book by um, Amelia, Amelia Gentleman. Gentleman. Thank you, Rubina. Um, I wanted to just to pick up on what you said about the difference between the our treatment of Ukrainians and those from Sudan and of Afghanistan as well. Well, yes, yes, but without without. totally accepting that the awful situation of the war in Ukraine. I think that it, we have to consider that it is not totally coincidental that the people that we are welcoming from Ukraine are white Europeans. And I know, because I work with a charity helping destitute asylum seekers, that um, the situation of anybody who is not Ukrainian is absolutely dire and may may even be be made worse because some of the hosting schemes have been affected by the fact that people who were hosting are now hosting Ukrainians who actually get a, a financial allowance. Um, and it's getting even more difficult to find hosting schemes to host those from places like Sudan or Afghanistan or wherever. Absolutely. Uh, 
Thanks, Trabina. Anybody um, else? I was trying to find a quote that I had um, from Margaret Thatcher um, when the government was asked, it came out later in papers, to take some Vietnamese refugees. And it was such a blatantly racist quote that, you know, um, this is Britain, you know, and British society is white. And I mean, it, it was an outrageous quote, um, but I can't find it at the moment. Um, and it was back in the 70s, but anyway. And it wasn't disclosed till sometime afterwards. But anyway, yes, Ravina, agree wholeheartedly. <clears throat> Sue? Even given the fact that Britain is no longer in the EU, wasn't it, wouldn't it have been the case that it would have been completely shamed if they hadn't taken in the Ukrainians? Because every other country in Europe was doing so to a much greater extent. So yes, of course, of course, it's blatantly, you could see it's blatantly racist, but I'm sure the government would just have not considered not taking in Ukrainians simply because of that element that they would have been so out of line with the countries that had, they, they had at least been recently totally aligned with. But it does definitely has a huge impact on the ones coming from other countries. And as regards the Sudanese, we have had in waves Sudanese, because of course, after the Darfur horrors, we had large numbers of Sudanese coming. We're just beginning to get, I have seen a few recently of the more recent arrivals, but I don't think we've had it, any numbers from as a result of the current problems there. And that will probably still happen. We probably will get more now. And of course, we've got a largely Afghan young men. Yeah. But a couple of things there, Sue. I think, yes, Britain probably had no choice but to take in um, Ukrainian refugees. But I think Britain moved with uncharacteristic alacrity in doing so. Hmm. You don't see the British government, um, you know, exerting such efforts with other countries and certainly not um, offering financial assistance yeah. to bring people in. You know, it's, it's completely out of character with what we've seen. And I think the reason we're not seeing... Um, uh, Sudanese refugees from this recent conflict is because of the hostile environment, because the government is making it increasingly difficult um, for people to come. It's just not something that um, that they can do. There, there are no legal means to come in to the country other than these small boats. I mean, if you come with your sure. passport and yeah. you're, you know, you're fine and, and declare um, that you are coming and claiming refugee status, but who is able to do that when you're fleeing a crisis, when you're fleeing persecution? Yeah. It's not possible. The film? Just to say that you need to be aware as well of the Hong Kong situation. Yes. Because there, there is a welcome of sorts yes. to people from Hong Kong. My congregation has gone up from 30 Hong Kong people on a second Sunday of the month to three, plus 300 now. And um, they, according to this book that you were referring to, the recent report, they the Chinese are now the ones that experience racist incidents more than any other group in this country. Well, I think, I think what happened was there was a, first of all, the Hong Kong thing, I think, that's because of historical ties, you know, that yeah. the government made specific allowances. But Sudan equally has historical ties to the UK. Um, and I think um, the Chinese, the increase in racist attitudes towards Chinese was probably linked to the COVID pandemic oh, but... and people's ideas about, you know, the origins of it. And I think it, it sort of went up just at that time. Yep. It's true. 
Absolutely right. I just think you need to be a little bit more nuanced when you say it's just one or the other. You know, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Richard? No, no, I don't have anything. Yeah. I'm looking around just to see, is there anything in the chat box, Gloria? No, there's, um, I don't see any. Okay. Uh, yeah, Trish yeah. from Leeds. Trish? Thank you very much. That that was so clear and and spoke so so well to my to my heart and for my limited experience because I've been involved with destitute asylum seekers probably for about the last ten years and the language the narrative now has normalised the terrible language because I'm sure you do it too you know, with this phrase, illegal asylum seekers, there is no such thing as an no, illegal no. asylum seeker. No. But they've made it normal. It, mm. It's right. Everybody believes they are illegal, who, who don't actually want to think about it in terms of, or who aren't just maybe faced with the reality of, particularly, you know, young men who, who've been wandering our streets for God knows how many years, waiting to get some kind of result on their case. And and I think I, I think it's quite frightening the way language has been so abused and somehow I don't know how as church we take it back somehow we we do something quite active to challenge that use of language because it is it, it has evil results evil things happen step by step by step by step when it becomes the normal way to treat people. Mm -hmm. So I not see. maybe a, a helpful comment, but um, but thank you for for yes. No, I think you. I hundred percent. I agree with you. Um, I I think you know on a positive note. I think throughout um, you know from the time I was speaking about the eighties and um, the arrival of asylum seekers in greater numbers in the UK. It has been the churches and the mosques um, and the temples that have offered protection to people. Mm -hmm. um, even when the government was doing their worst, there was faith groups who were striking, doing everything in their power to strike the balance. And, um, you know, this um, illegal migration bill has gone through the the commons now but it's being heavily challenged in the house of lords and the archbishop of canterbury spoke mm. quite forcefully about it you mm. know and mm. against it okay. and um a, a, and that it's undermining christian values and you know really spoke quite powerfully about it and again i think that as church there has to be um a, a way that we deal with this because it's not being dealt with um, in a with any humanitarian yeah. by the government. No, no, yeah. Thank you. Joseph. Yeah, um, I I found both presentations very stimulating, and I agree with most of them. Most of the points made. I think, um, uh, however, what puzzling in my head is I think there is a difference between the statement that Carmen made in his report of saying that society at large is not, is not institutionally racist. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Whilst there is a recognition of particular institutions being found as institutionally racist. And suppose what I'm trying to say here is, I think it is a dangerous ground then to be saying that the whole of society is institutionally racist. I don't think that that's going to take us anywhere. Richard? Yeah, yeah, I uh, I, I agree with that. Um, I hadn't specifically thought about that a lot. I think Scarman was thinking, it was almost, almost putting up the idea of a society like South Africa was some years ago when with apartheid where you have laws across the whole of society that, that discriminate. 
and um, I don't want to say that he was by by painting it that way. It was almost impossible to say British society was institutionally racist. But I think the point you made is important, and that we should um, make it more often. Are we talking about institutional racism across the whole of society, or are we talking about institutional racism in the police or in housing or whatever it might be? Um, yes, I, 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 I would ask the question: Where is it not institutionally racist, Ben? Can can you tell me of any one of our institutions? Because there's institutional racism within education. There's institutional racism within uh, the medical field. It mm -hmm. is in our housing. It is, you know, tell. I think it, it'd be easier to discuss those that are not institutionally racist, if there are any. Yes, however, the point that I'm making is that is a, a, maybe a rather negative approach to put everything in one basket. Yeah. Each instit yes, institutions are part and parcels of the society, but they're not the whole of society. Yes, they are powerful. Yes, they are powerful. I think the problem is, is that we get these reports one after another, right? And there is nothing that can actually... Um, be monitoring where these recommendations are actually going. And I, you know, I, it, it is a sudden fact that, that we've had a report after report after report where recommendations are not just moving forward. I suppose what I'm saying is, is the, I feel, a very, you know, sort of quite uncomfortable and not necessarily very helpful in moving us forward by actually then moving from identifying institutions that are institutionally racist and then collectively say that the whole of British society is institutionally racist. Um, I think um, one of the things I possibly should have said um, in terms of the McPherson report mm. is that um, although it it, it said that institutional racism exists. It hasn't, um, it was never sort of incorporated into law. So nobody can ever, nothing can ever happen to, you know, nobody's ever been found guilty of institutional racism. No institution has ever been found. Mm -hmm. But it is something that makes people stop and think that there that reform is needed within the institution mm -hmm. that's being discussed. And I think one of the reasons that um, the Sewell report was so condemned mm -hmm. um, was because it's like a denial of things that people have fought to get established since Scarman. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's quite emotive because... Yes. There is, you know, it, it. People feel it. People live it, and yeah, yeah. to suggest that it isn't there. Yeah. No. No. There, there is no way that I'm supporting the Sewell. No. Um, <laughs> no way whatsoever. Um, but I just wonder whether um, this sort of trend, there is a danger of it actually being backfiring, and nothing actually um, um, happens in terms of improvement because then it becomes ingrained. Well, that's what we are, you know, so yeah. nothing can happen. I, it just I, makes sense. Yes, you are. Thank you. You're, you are, Joseph. Thanks. The, Gloria and then Adetone. Okay. I just wanted to uh, to bring up this sewer report again. Uh, Margaret Ann, you, f you felt that they were not independent. So can you kind of uh, let me speak to that? Because I don't know why... I mean, they were they were like supposed to be independent. So I don't know if you have any. Well, okay, I guess. And, and, and there's one more thing. Sorry about the mm -hmm. uh, about the institutional racism. I guess it's about definitions, isn't it? Because apparently, uh, when I listen to commentary on the sewer report, they say that they defined it as they define institutional racism as something that is uh, codified. So if it's in the law, then if you say your organization says we will we'll treat black people differently, then that's to them, that's what is defined as institutional racism. So that's what they were arguing that there wasn't, it wasn't really 
is something that is in the UK. But I guess if you change the definition, then then it, you know, we can speak to that. But yeah, I think the point, the, the first point is, how, is there any reason why you thought they weren't an independent group? Um, okay, I should have clarified this, Gloria. Thank you for bringing it up. Um, it was an it was an independent commission, therefore it had no um no weight in terms of legislative process. The government appointed the commission uh -huh. um, and, and handpicked the people who were on it. And I guess mm. that's what I meant. But the Sewell report, although it got a lot of publicity, in itself had no weight in terms mm of um, legislating for change. In response to the Sula report, the government published, oh, Richard, do you remember the name, Father Phil? The, the government response to the Sula report, mm, yes. which they endorsed. Yes, the recommendation. Everything that Sewell said. Kemi Badernock um, was a minister for equalities um, and she oh. endorsed every aspect of it. And they reinforced the idea that institutional racism does, is not an issue to be, that needs to be addressed in Britain. Okay. of them have been implemented up to this point. Thank you, Margaret Ann. Uh, we have two minutes to go, and I think uh, Adichon just wants to make a comment, Comment, please, Adichon. <laughs> no, she says no. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much. So, well, uh, all I want to say is thank you very much to everyone. I think it's, it's always interesting to hear questions, to hear comments. And uh, the, the discussions are always rich. So thank you very, very much for that. I want to encourage you to please, please invite friends, uh, invite colleagues, members of the family to come and join us at the next webinar. We still have five more to go. And these are all in preparation of our uh, celebrations next year. Uh, next year, April, Kaja will be celebrating 40 years and we have two special days next year. And these webinars are supposed to give a taster to everybody of the work that has been going on for the last number of years. So please do have a look at the ads and um, advertise it as widely as you possibly can. I would always, always appreciate if people join Taj and become members. I think most of you who are here today are members, but if, if not, then please do join Taj. My thanks again to Margaret Ann and to Richard for fabulous talks. It, it has left us with a lot to think about. So thank you, Margaret and Richard, for giving up your time and for preparing the talks for tonight. Thank you to everybody for giving up an hour and a half to come and to be part of this webinar. I can now only wish you all a very pleasant evening. And I'm going to ask Father Phil to give us a blessing.